Uh, okay, uh, thank you guys for uh, sticking around after the food has arrived. I'm very excited to be talking about our recent work on tungsten ditelluride. Uh, here we have an artistic representation of this material. This is the cross-sectional view. Here's the Van der Waals gap that we saw in the TEM image earlier uh, of different materials. And you can see this material is actually kind of complicated in this crystal structure. The red is the tungsten and the, and the purple is the tellurium. You see that these guys have sort of dimerized. You have these distorted rhombi. And the layers are not equivalent. They're, 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 they're uh, rotated with respect to each other. So um, this has actually a lot of richness to, uh, to what we might be able to see in this material. Um, and, and some of that, and, and, and we'll be getting into some of it here, but regarding the, where the crystal structure itself comes in, we only have one piece, which I'll touch on in a bit. But before the, the cheese of the pizza gets into your brain and causes you to fall asleep, I just want to give you a flash of what I hope that you will take away from this talk. Uh, uh, moving forward, and maybe maybe we can talk in, in detail later. Uh, this is a top-down view of a single monolayer, an artistic, an artistic representation of a single monolayer of this tungsten telluride material. Again, you see say these chains of the tungsten atoms. And what we found in the monolayer is that there are two phases uh, that exist in different regimes of doping. Here, you can, if the system is undoped, essentially inside an insulating phase in the bulk, there appear to be edge modes, and in particular helical edge modes, indicating that the system is a top 2D topological insulate. And that'll be, after some introduction, that'll be the first part uh, of the data that we'll probably be presenting. Then, if we dope the system in, in deep into the conduction band, it turns out that the system becomes a superconductor. You have, you have Cooper pairing, and you have a zero resistance phase uh, that we can observe. Now, each of these is individually already pretty exciting, and it turns out that both of these are accessible in the same crystal solely with electrostatic gates. Okay, and this is, this is unprecedented uh, to have both of these phases in the same material accessible uh, in situ when your device is cold in your cryostat. Okay, so I'm hoping to convince you by the end that this is the case and that there will be some exciting things that we can do with this, with this platform moving forward. Um, so I'll begin with an outline of the materials platform and uh, of the material in particular, starting with the 3D crystal and how we protect these samples in the ultra thin limit. And I'll, use the, I'll briefly discuss trilayer WT2 which is expected to be a 2D semi-metal as our sort of litmus test, uh, as our control to see, OK, is our fabrication scheme working? And then we'll look at the new phases for 2D crystals, which is the topological insulator and the low, low density superconductor. There's also a lot of other exciting phenomena that occur in this crystal. And you may hear more about this from uh, Su Yang Shu, a postdoc uh, working with us, along with Chong, uh, at the Shapir seminar on Monday. And I encourage everyone to attend this. Now. 3D tungsten telluride looks like this. This is an optical microscopy image. You see it has this sort of long needle-like shape. And if we zoom in, you see these, uh, this sort of looks like pages of a book. It's already folding out in itself. And this is pretty indicative of what we expect for 2D material, for these atomic layer Van der Waals materials, where if we were to zoom in somewhere, wherever these guys eventually meet, you'll see that they're cleaving at a single atomic plane associated with the Van der Waals gap. Okay, and when we do exfoliation, we're literally doing this sort of peeling structure, peeling it apart at that layer. And this is where a lot of great utility comes from. This, this material is also, you can see this is actually a pretty big crystal. And the fact that this crystal can be grown large and relatively cleanly is, has a lot of interesting consequences already for the 3D compound. So um, let me briefly review the crystal structure. We, already, we just heard a talk about the wonderful properties of the semiconducting compounds, which have this particular structure. You see this sort of honeycomb lattice, where the, where the collagen has, has there are two collagens, one directly above another, and the monolayer has strongly broken immersion symmetry, leading to a lot of uh, a lot of interesting effects. However, these these materials, tungsten telluride, and some cases of molybdenum telluride, have a, one, a distorted one T structure, which looks like this. Okay, you have again these tungsten uh, the, the the metal ion chains uh, forming this very anisotropic structure, and these unusual uh, rhombi rhombuses uh, in the cross section. The consequence is that where, whereas here you actually have a semiconductor, this is a semi-metallic state. And this is actually borne out in the, in the bulk crystal. Quite evidently, we have, we have all sorts of measurements that confirm that we pretty much have uh, two pole pockets and two electron pockets of equal density. One of the consequences of a semi-metallic state is you expect a large magnetic resistance, which is dependent on the crystal quality and on the doping level. And what was found in, in this groundbreaking work that sort of introduce this material back to our world, is that if you apply that large magnetic field perpendicular to the planes and investigate the magnetic resistance, you see here's the percentage change in resistance as a function of field. And we get this quadratic behavior, this is a log-log plot, quadratic behavior all the way up to 
almost 60 Tesla and a 10 million percent change. And in fact, this has even, has even been improved upon as crystals have gotten more pure. This is very good. This is, had already opened up a field of extreme magnetoresistance resistance phenomenon in 3D crystals. But what this is, what's great for our lab is that we know from this, these sorts of measurements and other investigations that the pair crystal is a very high quality. And by that I mean that the charge is not doped, the charge remains compensated, and the system has a high mobility. Otherwise, this phenomenon would not be observed. Okay, so that's a great start. So let's have an idea. What, 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 we might, what might we try to look into when we tune, when we exfoliate it down to the monolayer limit? Well, a prediction here at MIT by Dan Fu and his colleagues is that the system should be a 2D topological insulator in the monolayer limit. Uh, I'll get back to, in a bit. This is the band structure diagram. You see these bulk states are actually overlapping a bit. I'll touch on that a bit later. But the edge modes, the spin polarized edge modes given by this color plot in energy momentum space is pretty clear. There, you can also take, uh, take pictures from old papers and, and type binding models of this material and see, oh, this looks kind of similar to the old models where there could be some kind of exotic exotic insulator phase. It's something we might keep an eye out for, but I won't be talking about this. It's just another idea of something to, to think about. Um, and then you see the predictions on these types of things have been going back for many decades. So, you know, if you wanted, if you got very excited and just started exfoliating and grabbing devices in the air and you have just a quick type of context like people did with graphene, uh, you, you, you get disappointed. <laughs> Here you have the conductance versus temperature. You have the thick bulk compound and you see, okay, the conductance rises by a couple orders of magnitude as you lower the temperature, indicative of the high initial quality of the parent crystal. But as you thin it down, it gets worse and worse, and eventually it flips over, and you get an insulator. In fact, the monolayer turns out to have, uh, it's pretty much impossible to measure. It becomes completely oxidized. You don't even need a, you don't need a transport device to see this. You can even look at the flakes just as exfoliated. Here's a piece that here's a monolayer. It's a bilayer and a four-layer. You leave it out in a, for a few days, and you see that, okay, the monolayer is almost completely transparent. The bilayer appears to have changed as well. We know we're getting something different than what we started with. And so this has motivated ourselves and many other groups to start looking at ways to protect our samples as we fabricate them. And so we developed here um, a glove box system. This is now quite common in our community. That inside we have an argon overpressure and filters to keep the atmosphere inside with extremely low levels of oxygen and water to protect our exfoliated crystals. So we do all our exfoliation, flake hunting, vendor wall stacking inside the glove box. We have built custom tools to go in there and fit nicely inside. And so you don't have to use the gloves all the time. Uh, and and the, the, in a cartoonish form, the concept is essentially that you take this air-sensitive material, encapsulate it in air-insensitive material like boron nitride, thereby separating it from your dirty substrate, having a clean atomic interface for the material itself, and then protecting it from, say, oxygen molecules when you have to take it. Inevitably, you will have to take it out of your glove box and then put it into a cryo stack. And so we hope to create ultra-clean devices here, and in particular, devices that don't degrade. Now, as the, as the canary in the coal mine, uh, we, we tried out trilayers, trilayer trunks and teller, which is predicted in all theoretical calculations to remain a semi-metal just like the bulk material. And, for, and, and if there is equal compensation, we should expect to see some sort of large quadratic, not quadratic magnetic resistance. Now, does, does the quality get preserved? Well, first, let's take a look and see if it remains metallic. Indeed, uh, let me just refresh you here, the bulk samples, this is the resistance versus temperature. The resistance drops very nicely by a few orders of magnitude. I'm taking a nice metallic, a nice metallic uh, piece of material. If we do this, you know, the, the old style of fabrication where we ex it's exposed to air and we just throw contacts down, you see the resistance rises, behaves pretty naturally. This is not even a three-layer. This is pretty. This is a reasonably thick, a couple nanometer thick piece. But if we do the protective fabrication on the three-layer thick sample, we see that we get this this decent temperature dependence with the Resistance ratio from room temperature to low temperature of about of a little over a factor of 10. So we haven't quite gotten to the same quality as the original bulk sample, but we seem to have improved. And so that's a good step to, to see where we are. Now, then the question becomes, have we doped it and made it a, a metal, or does it remain a semi-metal of some kind? And I've already indicated that magneto resistance is the answer, and or is, it can be an answer. And here's again the percent change in resistance as a function of magnetic field, and we do indeed see this nonlinear, nearly pretty much quadratic rise in resistance as a function of magnetic. Unlike in the 3D bulk samples, we have the added functionality of a, two, of a gate electrode, and so we can tune the density of this two-dimensional system. And in doing so, we see, say, as we add electrons to the system, we see the magnetic resistance persist and then saturate, and in the highest magnetic fields, there's no magnetic resistance at all. 
let's briefly, I'll take you a, a brief detour to explain why. Uh, you know, you can basically go back to your simple Judah model and see if you have a single carrier type, you get no magnetic resistance if you have a Hall bar geometry. And if you have a compensated semi-model, you get this large quadratic magnetic resistance. And in between, you have an uncompensated case, fewer holes and more electrons. You get a low field magnetic resistance, saturating to a constant high magnetic fields. And this is pretty much directly analogous to what we see in our device. We have Hall data and Shubnikov toss oscillations. You can see them here. And we've also analyzed and supported this uh, interpretation. So, um, so the advent of using glove box techniques on air sensitive van der Waals materials has opened us up to a whole zoo of compounds uh, that would otherwise have been almost impossible to work with, and inclu uh, including that particular semi metal in the tri layer, uh, several others, uh, and that being a group, for example, including uh, ferromagnetic uh, insulators. But I'm talking first about the 2D topological insulator, uh, at which the monolayer was predicted to be in our case. The, the one slide introduction to the 2D topological insulator is that you have a two dimensional electronic system which is gapped in the interior. There should be no states available. The conduction should be zero. And the conduction should be zero. And around the boundary, you have helical edge modes, which means you have counter propagating electrons with opposite spin. So one mode, or at least an odd number, odd number, odd pair, odd number of pairs of modes circumnavigating the sample. If you make a simple two terminal structure here, then you'll get a resistance that should be half of the quantum of resistance associated with two parallel channels traversing each edge of the device. Now, that's already interesting, and there's more be predicted to occur beyond that. If you were to manage to take this helical mode and contact it with a superconductor on one side and find another way to gap it out, some different kind of gap than a superconducting gap on, uh, uh, opposite it, and you can create a minor bound state in principle at that interface. And this is a subject of intense investigation with all, for all methods of creating helical modes, from nanowires to 3D topological insulators, as well as other 2D topological insulator platforms. And so far, to my knowledge, uh, especially with gate tunable structures, you have always had to have the situation where you have one material providing the helical states, okay, here in red, and a different material providing the superconducting phase in blue. And, uh, and what, hasn't been, what hasn't been managed to find a situation where you can have both of them in the same material, and hopefully not have to deal with this interface issue that results from having to deposit or sputter, clean these interfaces up, or whatnot. So, um, so, what I, so coming back to this picture from earlier in my talk, I hope to convince you that we have seen both the 2D topological insulator phase at low doping, and then the superconducting phase at slightly higher doping, but accessible by electrostatic gate electrodes. Okay, so we'll start with bonus and halters. So let's briefly review the experimental status of uh, quantum spin of 2D TIs. There are two dominant platforms for the top 2D topological insulator, the murky Telluride quantum well and the indium arsenide gallium antimony quantum well. And both of their first discoveries were predicated on this <coughs> having a resistance plateau near charge neutrality associated with approximately two E squared range inductance, or one half H over E squared in resistance. Um, and several follow up studies have, have been ongoing from the initial discoveries. Um, now, that's good for physics, but from a utility perspective, there are some deficiencies. One is that the bulk gaps are very small, which means that they can only operate at very low temperature, 4 Kelvin or, low, or lower. And then the semiconductor heterostructures are themselves buried by a capping layer of, of related materials. And that means that they're hard to access directly. You have to do etching uh, to expose even an edge of the material to be able to touch it. And you can't access the 2D, uh, uh, the 2D interior. So knowing this, theorists have been very busy predicting a wide variety of crystal, 2D crystalline topological insulators, which are predicted to have, uh, I flashed them here, there are, some other, there are also some experiments in very particular cases. Um, but the main point here is that in these theories, the band gaps are predicted to be rather large, which has the hope for higher temperature operation where the edge modes are dominant. The exposed nature means that there, it's easier to create interfaces, and particularly, it allows for the full toolkit of van der Waals heterostructures, which we hope to be able to apply. So tungsten tolerate is one such prediction here. And, and, and the initial, and there's one question is, you know, does this material have a gap? Does the interior, is the interior insulated? In, because the initial prediction showed what appeared to be a semi-metallic bulk behavior. And, uh, but then some follow-up theory said, oh no, if you do your ab initio calculation some other way, you can get a gap as big as 150 millivolts. So there was some disagreement, and so you have to do an experiment. And there's been a lot of wonderful work done in this direction, particularly in transport from the Washington group that shows that 
do some clever device geometry implementations, they see that indeed the interior of these flakes is insulating and there is some edge conduction. So you see here they have the conductance as a function of gate voltage. Your charge neutrality, you see they have this residual conductance when their device geometry is sensitive to conduction along the edge, but zero conductance if they're only sensitive to conduction in the interior. There's been also a variety of spectroscopy techniques, both in angle result photo emission spectroscopy and scanning tunneling spectroscopy, that seem to indicate that there is some sort of bulk gap uh, of order 45 millivolts um, that, that is actually pretty, pretty big, much larger than other 2DTI, uh, uh, 2DTI platforms. So our strategy, we wanted to see that, you know, we wanted to see that we could get actually the quantum of resistance that's expected for a 2DTI and which has been seen in the other 2DTI platforms. And what we, what we wanted to do is to move the contacts away. Here when you have these raised contacts, okay, above some substrate, you always have a tending effect and you can get some of this degradation I was describing before, regardless of whether or not you, you whenever you take it out of the glove box, excuse me. So the strategy is as follows. We have our, we're gonna try and contact the tungsten telluride with itself. So what we're going to do is we have this tungsten telluride piece here. The contacts are very far away and we have a global top gate doping the whole system, whole system homogeneously. And with these individual local gates that we can activate to then deplete that region in between. Okay? So, we'll, so in schematic form, we have, this, we have this globally doped system, which exhibits some resistance. And then we start depleting this one of these local channels with a, with a defined length. The resistance starts to increase. And in this case, what we find is not a simple insulator phase, but actually the resistance plateaus. And this would be consistent with this, this end mode picture. In fact, if we take the, the difference of this resistance from the, high, from the highly doped case, we see that indeed, uh, and we apologize for the, for the uh, you know, transfer issue between uh, operating systems, we see that the resistance step is really a order half of the quantum of resistance, which is what we expect for this particular material. And what we believe is really important <laughs> here is that we do have this homogeneous interface between the metallic doped tungsten telluride and the edge modes themselves. And I remind you that the reason that this factor of two is extremely important is that it comes from having a single mode carrying the current along each edge. Now, it's possible that we have uh, some diffusive edge, a trivial diffusive edge at some unfortunate length scale that happens to give these resistance values. Okay? And part of the reason for this uh, device structure is that we have all of these little finger gates. So on a single device, we can do a variety of different length scales for this undoped channel. And so we have, here we have the edge resistance versus the length of the, the length of the gate. Each color and symbol is coming from a different device, and each data point is from a different gate on that device. And what you see is that at long length scales, all the devices show some high resistance value that seems to generally increase with the length of the channel. And as we go thinner and thinner, not shorter and shorter, they deviate from this long channel trend and start to cluster with a lower bound on this h over 2e squared, which several of the devices do, do seem to exhibit. And so this, this tells us that we don't seem to be having this sort of tri trivial diffusive edge modes there, which can occur in some of the semiconductor heterostructures. So one thing important about this topological phase is that the edge modes have, uh, are protected by symmetry. If you break that symmetry, you hope to see that, uh, that the properties of this phase disappear in some fashion. And what, we, what I mean by that here is that at zero magnetic field, you have this edge mode. And say if you have a clean edge, you can expect a band structure that has a Kramer's point where there's two spin degenerate states existing at the same point. If you were to apply magnetic field non-parallel to the spin, uh, the spin orbit axis, you can hybridize these states and open a band gap and see that the, conduction, uh, the conductance of these edge modes should drop away. So let's see what happens in the experiment. Here we have the here's a semi-log plot of the conductance as a function of the local gate voltage. So we see we have this generally this plateau hovering around 2e square over h at zero magnetic field. As we increase the magnetic field, the first, at first, the conduct, conductance of the edges drops pretty homogeneously. And then as we keep going, and I'm gonna go back and forth a few times, you see that something kind of funny goes on. Here, not much changes. Here, not much changes. But right here, we drop by more than another order of magnitude. By about another order of magnitude. And we keep going, and we see that persists to be the case. So for this very narrow range of gate voltages, we see an exponentially reducing conductance with magnetic field which may be, may be a guy gap, but let's do a little bit more. Let's start, let's start turning, on the turning up the temperature and seeing does it see, look the, see if this looks like an activation gap. 
So here is again the conductance versus magnetic field for a particular gate voltage. And we see that it drops exponentially with the magnetic field. This is a semi log plot. And as we increase the temperature, we see that the slope of this exponential drop is being reduced. That's, that's more or less what we expect. So let's try the Arrhenius plot. That's the logarithm of conductance versus one over temperature. And if we expect the Zeeman field as gapping out the edges, then the gap uh, should be linearly proportional to the magnetic field. So we throw in the V here, and we see that the entire two dimensional data set indicated in this plot collapses onto a single line. Right? And this line indicates that we have conductance that drops exponentially with magnetic field and also with lowering temperature, lowering inverse temperature. And the, sim the slope here is given by the G factor, which we find is of order five. Okay? Now that's. We don't have any predictions for what this number should be, but it's what we seem to see in the experiment. So, okay, if we have a gap here, what's going on everywhere else? Well, then we have a doped 1D edge. Here we have a whole doped edge, and here we should have an electron doped edge. And there, the conductance is finite, but somewhat reduced from the zero field value. The line shape of this, of this behavior in those gate voltages is as follows, where it drops pretty rapidly for the first couple of Tesla, and then saturates to a constant above that magnetic field scale. And what, the, what it seems to be, that this, while we were thinking about this for a while, we stumbled upon this uh, nice paper that has, an, has a pretty good, seems to have a consistent explanation that has the same line shape, which is if you have these helical edges with a charge bundle here, some sort of dot that's coupled to the mode, at zero magnetic field, this, this should not cause any form of scattering. But as you, as you turn off time reversal symmetry, the spin can randomize in this dot, and therefore give you a reduced transmission as you go through. Basically, given a sufficiently long dwell time here, you can have 50% uh, 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 reflection or transmission. And if you have a few of these dots, you expect indeed only uh, some finite but large fraction of the initial conductance to remain once they're fully scattered, once they're giving you a full 50% scattering in your edge modes. And of course, we, have, we should have these on both edges of our sample. OK. One cherry on top is that the insulating phase appears to persist to high temperature, or more precisely stated, in our, in our measurement, we can see that the channel conductance corresponding to this 2e square over h, given by the two helical edge modes on either side of the sample, persists up to nearly 100 Kelvin. And above this temperature scale, we see that the channel conductance starts to increase, indicative of thermally activated bulk channels. Uh, that, 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 uh, that tells us that you know, these edge modes are really dominating the system for quite a large temperature range over an order of magnitude higher than is seen in the other semiconductor heterostructures. And this feature has a lot of, a lot of potential for utility in the future because now we can actually operate at much higher temperatures, uh, maybe for some optical studies. You know, it's hard to, it's, it's, as I understand, it's kind of hard to operate at extremely low temperatures, but this range is, is much easier. So, so there's some potential there. So we're very excited to see this data uh, pop out as well. So now, as motivated earlier, we want to we wanted to add superconductivity into these modes, into this into this material, and we were we were planning to go through the original route, the, the usual route of depositing or sputtering some sort of material. But as I've already mentioned to you, we see we found that when we doped this system, it turned into a superconductor itself. Okay? And indeed, if we take the same uh, doped uh, material, this is exactly the same device that I showed you before that exhibit this nice properties of the 3D topological insulator, but doped so that it's all in the production band. We see that the resistance starting at some finite value then drops very rapidly at around 1 Kelvin and to some finite value, which is determined, we believe, by a contact resistance, which is a, a, an unfortunate feature of the device structure that we were using to investigate the edge modes, which is not great for doing proper four terminal measurements. But this was an exciting discovery, so we decided, but we needed to push it further. So we took some time to retool our fabrication and have these pre-patterned contacts, as was described by uh, um, described earlier. And uh, so here you see we have our, our, our multi-tonal device and our tungsten telluride uh, sheet spanning all the contacts, and then also a global top gate and a global bottom gate. Okay, so no local gates in this measurement. And indeed, in this structure, we find in a, in a four-terminal measurement the resistance does drop all the way to zero, roughly at around 300 millicouple, a little bit, a little bit above 300 millicouple. But you see, this transition is rather broad. It's rather broad, and um, and that you know that can be due to the inherent behavior of a two D superconductor. It can also be just that by the fact that it's a inhomogeneous material. So all these things are playing in. In particular, you can see that we have this sort of double hump structure, which is probably a result of some sort of inhomogeneity. Well, let's go through some of the simple checks. Here we have our four pro uh, our, our four probe voltage current characteristic. At high temperature, we have in red 
the ohmic behavior that we expect for a metal. And then at low temperature, we get the classic, a sort of a nearly classic nonlinear IV curve, in particular exhibiting the very sharp jump from the voltage at the critical current value. We can take the derivative of this curve. So this is the differential resistance as a function of current. And we see this very large spike in the differential resistance associated with that same, uh, with the same uh, critical current. And in particular, at low bias, we really see that the differential resistance is zero. Here, we have, instead of using temperature, we're using magnetic field to kill the superconducting phase. And we see the, that we recover on the behavior at the same temperature, but higher magnetic field. So that's, that's the properties of a fixed gate voltage. Now let's look at what happens as we tune the density of the material. Right. So this is the same differential resistance curve. Here on the outside, we have a normal state resistance, which is generally this sort of light bluish color. Here in this deep blue, we have zero resistance state. And then this bright yellow line is indicative of the high differential resistance at the critical current value. As we deplete the system coming down this part of this side of the axis, we see that the critical current is homogeneously being, uh, is monotonically being reduced, merging at some particular gate voltage value, and you get a single peak in, at zero bias uh, on this side that indicates the, the insulating phase at low temperatures. We can also look at this thing as, as a function of temperature instead of uh, 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 DC bias current. Um, this oscillation is a result of the presentation, it's not part of the data. What we have is a temperature and gate voltage, and again, at high gate voltage, we have, this is the normalized resistance that starts from the white color, which indicates no change, and then drops and comes to zero in this sort of half dome of this dark blue color, and we have the 50% resistance value marked in the black dots. And we see that this also is homogeneous, um, excuse me, monotonically being reduced to zero temperature as we approach the same, uh, almost the same voltage, indicating a, a transition from this superconductor possibly metallic state close to this region. We don't really know what's going on here. And then we end up having an insulating phase on the other side, indicated by the red colors, where the resistance is rising as temperature is being low. Now, having established these particular quantities, we now can look at the magnetic field effect, and we find something a little bit unusual. This is, again, the normalized resistance. And this is the, uh, at the in yellow, we have large gate voltage, where the critical temperature is high. And in brown, we have low gate voltage where the critical temperature is lower. And what we find, surprisingly, is that the upper critical field of this, this, in this case is increasing. It takes more magnetic field to kill the superconductor, despite the fact that the superconductivity itself appears in some fashion to be weaker. Okay? Now, we can do the classic temperature dependence of this upper critical field, do our ginsburg landau fits, and get some sort of coherence length. Indeed, if we have a higher critical field, we expect a lower coherence length associated with it. And we see that this coherence length is increasing with gate voltage, where as superconductivity is, is improving. And um, so despite the fact that TC is, a, is, you know, this is our typical BCS formula for the coherence length is proportional Fermi velocity divided by, by, by the gap. This guy should be proportional to TC, but we also have this low density system where Fermi velocity is increasing as we dope the system. And this can resolve, uh, can resolve this different difference where as long as the Fermi velocity is increasing faster than the critical temperature, we may be having this increase in coherence length as, as the critical temperature is also increasing. So I'll conclude with a schematic phase diagram that we're, putting, we're beginning to understand about this material, where at low density we have uh, this quantum spin phase that well, as long as the bulk is insulating, we can get this phase persisting up to quite high temperatures, up to about 100 Kelvin. And then as we dope the system, we seem to have some sort of critical density uh, may, that may or not be sample dependent. We're still looking at this, above which we have the superconducting phase at electrostatically gate tunable, gate accessible uh, densities. And this will hopefully allow us in the future to build devices, say, very similar to what I showed you before for investigating the quantum spinal edge modes. But if we go to, some, go to some lower temperatures, we can hope to have the superconductor, superconducting phase on either side, proximitizing the edge mode, and then we can use in plane magnetic fields or use Van der Waals hetero structure to add a magnetic insulator to gap out uh, the edge modes here. We may be able to localize a minor on a bound state. And we'll see how we can find a way to investigate those at a future date. So with that, I'd like to thank the group and, and our materials providers um, and everyone else here in the community that's been of help, uh, uh, been of help as we've gone through uh, this research. Thank you very much. OK, we have time for questions. I wonder if the uh, total is better to know than gate, like three gates. Yes. So, um, as a general, 
Yeah, so the chemical potential should change smoothly as a function of position. It is often the case in TI that as you go to high enough chemical potential, the edge states will fully merge with the bulk states. So maybe that's going on. Honestly, that's probably a good thing that if you have an you have your, 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 your electronic state here, it actually directly hybridizes with the bulk state. That's actually probably a good thing, as long as we don't have uh, too much scattering in the bulk phase. Are you showing the density state of the superconductor? Yeah, the E curve. There's a small, small peak inside the gap. Yeah, yeah. So that's correlated with this. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll. Yeah. So you see, we have this. It's also this second transition that you prefer to have in the temperature difference. That seems to be directly correlated with. You see that there's early onset of some resistance appearing on the sample before the sharp could have occurred. That's associated with that. And then again, we take the derivative and we get the secondary peak. Okay. We believe it's some, I believe personally it's some sort of inhomogeneity in the sample. So if you have some density, the inhomogeneity in the density of electrons in your sample, or maybe some increased disorder in some, some area, then those regions will be more weakly superconducting and therefore have a lower critical current and a lower critical temperature. Now maybe there's something exotic going on. I'd be happy for any ideas, but, uh, but for now there's a, there is a trivial explanation, so uh, we go with the simple one for now. But we know that this, this is been produced. Yeah, yeah. People, and they also see that. Yeah, yeah. This, this sort of feature has been seen. It could be something else. We are not yeah, but the, the, yeah. We, a more directed experiment would be, uh, would be helpful for teasing out what exactly is going on here. This is the differential resistance, which is why it is not a much more dependent density of states. Right, this is not density of states. This is critical current. It's similar, like, look at curves, but an axis of different content. Are there any other questions? Well, is the super connectivity a simple formal well-known or something? Try to understand by the brain. An excellent topic for future research. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't know. We simply don't know. The density is pretty small. Yeah. So it's it's not super weak. Coupling regime. If it's VCS, it's not VCS, vanilla VCS. Yeah. Or if it's stronger coupling. But the coupling is not so strong that we're definitely in some sort of unconventional. Yeah, it's, it's not so clear that we have. Sure. Yeah. The coupling you mean to the Coulomb interaction? Then, you know, the, the, in terms of the ratio of the critical temperature, yeah. which is sort of kind of that characterizes how strong we come to So you can't turn by. Screen gate, some screen right. like yeah, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to tease these things out, and you know, even even doing some tunneling to see whether is there only one gap or two. You know, the, the, there is some, there may be some weak in, inversion breaking in the crystal structure a priori, as, and and so you may have some split Fermi surfaces that could do funny things as well. So anyway, well, I'm happy to discuss more about this sort of thing. There should be a lot of work to do. Uh, it, it, it's probably not Ising-like, okay? The inversion breaking is not purely of that type, okay? It, but it'll be some sort of very mixed, uh, mixed form of spin orbit coupling. Um, and there's some excellent theory being done in the Yang's group about this sort of thing here uh, that I think they could tell you more about. Yes? So for Jan, what's your channel length? Because you always seem to get... Uh, yeah, so, so let me point out that, you know, uh, yeah, so I'll point out that actually the bulk mean free path in the metallic phase is not longer than 10 nanometers, OK? So the edge is already growing substantially longer than that. And so there's clearly something limiting us. We're not sure what exactly. Those puddles that we seem to see very prominently at finite magnetic field may play a role at zero magnetic field as well if you have some sort of nonlinear non effect there. There's been some theory uh, about that. But, um, but right now, it's not that clear what, what is limiting us. The step with magnetic field or with without? No. Okay. Here. Yeah. So the length there is the. It's the length of the gate. No, the, the different the different particles. Ah, these are just different gates on different devices. The the, width, the, the, the length indicated as the width of the. It's the width, it's the length of the channel. 
basically the length of the edge connecting the metallic, the bulk doped metallic phases at states on either side. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, Kirk, let's start with one again. That's exciting. That's really exciting. Really excited about it, yeah. Yeah. Did you push stop broadcast or whatever? I pressed uh, and 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 something. Oh, <laughs> but this is still going. Okay.